A reading from the book, The Early Years, an autobiography of Charles Spurgeon. This details Spurgeon's conviction and conversion through much tribulation. My heart was fallow and covered with weeds, but on a certain day the great husbandman came and began to plow my soul. Ten black horses were his team, and it was a sharp plowshare that he used, and the plowers made deep furrows. The Ten Commandments were those black horses, and the justice of God, like a plowshare, tore my spirit. I was condemned, undone, destroyed, lost, helpless, hopeless. I thought hell was before me. Then there came a cross-plowing, for when I went to hear the gospel, it did not comfort me. It made me wish I had a part in it, but I feared that such a boon was out of the question. The choicest promises of God frowned upon me, and his threatenings thundered at me. I prayed, but found no answer of peace. It was long with me thus. The abundant benefit which we now reap from the deep plowing of our heart is enough of itself to reconcile us to the severity of the process. Precious is that wine which is pressed in the wine fat of conviction. Pure is that gold which is dug from the mines of repentance. And bright are those pearls which are found in the caverns of deep distress. We might never have known such deep humility if the Lord had not humbled us. We had never been so separated from fleshly trusting had he not by his rod revealed the corruption and disease of our heart. We had never learned to comfort the feeble-minded and confirm the weak had he not made us ready to halt and caused our sinew to shrink. If we have any power to console the weary, it is a result of our remembrance of what we once suffered, for here lies our power to sympathize. If we can now look down with scorn upon the boastings of vain, self-conceited man, it is because our own vaunted strength has utterly failed us and made us contemptible in our own eyes. If we can now plead with ardent desire for the souls of our fellow men, and especially if we feel a more than common passion for the salvation of sinners, we must attribute it in no small degree to the fact that we have been smitten for sin, and therefore knowing the terror of the Lord are constrained to persuade men. The laborious pastor, the fervent minister, the ardent evangelist, the faithful teacher, the powerful intercessor can all trace the birth of their zeal to the sufferings they endured through sin, and the knowledge they thereby attained of its evil nature. We have ever drawn the sharpest arrows from the quiver of our own experience. We find no sword blade so true in metal as those which have been forged in the furnace of soul trouble. A spiritual experience, which is thoroughly flavored with a deep and bitter sense of sin, is of great value to him that has had it. It is terrible in the drinking, but it is most wholesome in the bowels and in the whole of the afterlife. Possibly much of the flimsy piety of the present day arises from the ease with which men attain to peace and joy in these evangelistic days. We would not judge modern converts, but we certainly prefer that form of spiritual exercise which leads a soul by the way of weeping cross and makes it see its blackness before assuring it that it is clean every whit. Too many think lightly of sin and therefore think lightly of the Savior. He who has stood before his God convicted and condemned with a rope about his neck is a man to weep for joy when he is pardoned, to hate the evil which has been forgiven him, and to live to the honor of the Redeemer by whose blood he has been cleansed. Our own experience recalls us to the period when we panted for the Lord, even for him, our only want. Vain to us were the mere ordinances, vain as bottles scorched by the Samum and drained of their waters. Vain were ceremonies, vain as empty wells to the thirsty Arab. Vain were the delights of the flesh, bitter as the waters of Morah, which even the parched lips of Israel refused to drink. Vain were the directions of the legal preacher, useless as the howling of the wind to the benighted wanderer. Vain, worse than vain, were our refuges of lies which fell about our ears like Dagon's temple on the heads of the worshippers. One only hope we had, one sole refuge for our misery. 
save where that arc floated, north, south, east, and west, was one broad expanse of troubled waters. Save where that star burned, the sky was one vast field of unmitigated darkness. Jesus, 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 he alone, he without another, had become the solitary hiding place against the storm. As a wounded soldier lying on the battlefield, with wounds which, like fires, consume his moisture, utters only one monotonous cry of thrilling importunity, water, water, water. So did we perpetually send our prayers to heaven. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, Jesus, come to me. We have, we hope, many a time enjoyed nearness to the throne of grace and prayer, but perhaps never did such a prayer escape our lips as that which we offered in the bitterness of our spirit when seeking the Savior. We have often poured out our hearts with greater freedom, with more delight, with stronger faith, in more eloquent language. But never, never have we cried with more vehemence of unquenchable desire, or more burning heat of insatiable longing. There was in no sleepiness or sluggishness in our devotion. We did not then need the whip of command to drive us to labors of prayer, but our soul could not be content unless with sighs and lamentations. With strong crying and tears it gave vent to our bursting heart. Then we had no need to be dragged to our closets like oxen to the slaughter, but we flew to them like doves to their windows, and when there we needed no pumping up of desires, but they gushed forth like a fountain of waters, although at times we felt we could scarcely find them a channel. I remember the first time I ever sincerely prayed. I do not recollect the words I used. Surely there were few enough words in that petition. I had often repeated a form. I had been in the habit of continually repeating it. At last I came really to pray, and then I saw myself standing before God, in the immediate presence of the heart-searching Jehovah. And I said within myself, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I felt like Esther when she stood before the king, faint and overcome with dread. I was full of penitence of heart because of his majesty and my sinfulness. I think the only words I could utter were something like these, Oh, ah, and the only complete sentence was, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The overwhelming splendor of his majesty, the greatness of his power, the severity of his justice, the immaculate character of his holiness, and all his dreadful grandeur, these things overpowered my soul, and I fell down in utter prostration of spirit. But there was in that prayer a true and real drawing near to God. I have not many relations in heaven, but I have one whom I dearly love, who, I doubt not, often prayed for me, for she nursed me when I was a child and brought me up during part of my infancy, and now she sits before the throne in glory, suddenly called home. I fancy she looked upon her darling grandson, and as she saw him in the ways of sin, waywardness, and folly, she could not look with sorrow, for there are no tears in the eyes of glorified ones. She could not look with regret, because they cannot know such a filling before the throne of God. But ah, that moment when by sovereign grace I was constrained to pray, when all alone I bent my knee and wrestled, methinks I see her as she said, Behold, he prayeth, behold, he prayeth prayeth. Oh, I can picture her countenance. She seemed to have two heavens for a moment, a double bliss, a heaven in me as well as in herself, when she could say, Behold, he prayeth. I have known some who have suspended prayer through the idea that the petitions of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, and that therefore it was but committing sin to attempt to offer their supplications. Well can I remember when coming to Jesus myself that for years I sought pardon and found it not. Often in the deep anguish of my spirit did I stay my petitions, because I thought them hopeless. And when again the Holy Spirit drew me to the mercy seat, a deep horror rested on me at the recollection of my repeated but unanswered cries. I knew myself to be unworthy, and therefore I conceived that divine justice would not allow an answer to come to me. I thought that the heavens were brass above me, and that if I cried never so earnestly, the Lord would shut out my prayer. I durst not pray. 
I was too guilty, and when I did dare to pray, t'was hardly prayer, for I had no hope of being heard. No, I said, it is presumption, I must not plead with him, and when at times I would have prayed, I could not, something choked all utterance, and the spirit could only lament and long and pant and sigh to be able to pray. Yet I recollect, even as a child, God hearing my prayer. I cannot tell what it was about, it may have been concerning a mere trifle. But to me, as a child, it was important as the greatest prayer that Solomon ever offered for himself. And God heard that prayer. And it was thus early established in my mind that the Lord was God. And afterwards, when I came really to know him, for like the child Samuel, I did not then know the Lord, I only felt after him in prayer. Afterwards, when I came to cry to him intelligently, I had this prayer answered and that petition granted. And many a time since then, I am only telling what any who know the Lord could also say. Many a time since then, he has answered our requests. I cannot tell all about this manner, for there is many a secret between us and our dear Lord. It would not be prudent, proper, or even possible to mention all the answers to prayer which we have received, for there are love passages between Christ and the soul, which never must be told unless it be in choice company and on rare occasions. Neither in the church militant nor in the host triumphant is there one who received a new heart and was reclaimed from sin without a wound from Jesus. The pain may have been but slight and the healing may have been speedy, but in each case there has been a real bruise which required a heavenly physician to heal. With some of us, this wounding commenced in early life, for as soon as infancy gave place to childhood, the rod was exercised upon us. We can remember early conviction of sin and apprehensions of the wrath of God on its account. An awakened conscience in our most tender years drove us to the throne of mercy. Though we knew not the hand which chastened our spirit, yet did we bear the yoke in our youth. How many were the tender buds of hope which we then put forth? Alas, too soon to be withered by useful lusts. How often were we scared with visions and terrified with dreams, while the reproof of a parent, the death of a playfellow, or a solemn sermon made our hearts melt within us. Truly our goodness was but as a morning cloud in the early dew. But who can tell how much each of these separate woundings contributed to toward that killing by the law which proved to be the effectual work of God? In each of these arousings we discover a gracious purpose. We trace every one of these awakenings to his hand who washed over our path, determined to deliver us from our sins. The small end of that wedge which has since been driven home was inserted during those youthful hours of inward strife. Let none despise the strivings of the spirit in the hearts of the young. Let not boyish anxieties and juvenile repentances be lightly regarded. He incurs a fearful amount of guilt who in the least promotes the aim of the evil one by trampling upon a tender conscience in a child. No one can guess at what age children become capable of conversion. I at least can bear my personal testimony to the fact that grace operates on some minds at a period almost too early for recollection. When but young in years I felt with much sorrow the evil of sin. My bones waxed old with my roaring all the day long. Day and night God's hand was heavy upon me. I hungered for deliverance, for my soul fainted within me. I fear lest the very sky should fall upon me and crush my guilty soul. God's law had laid hold upon me and was showing me my sins. If I slept at night, I dreamed of the bottomless pit, and when I awoke, I seemed to feel the misery I had dreamed. Up to God's house I went, my song was but a sigh. To my chamber I retired, and there were tears and groans. I offered up my prayer without a hope and without a refuge, for God's law was flogging me with its tin-thonged whip and then rubbing me with brine afterwards, so that I did shake and quiver with pain and anguish, and my soul chose strangling rather than life, for I was exceeding sorrowful. That misery was sent for this reason, that I might then be made to cry to Jesus. Our Heavenly Father does not usually cause us to seek the Savior till he is whipped us clean out of all our confidence. He cannot make us in earnest after heaven till he has made us feel something of the intolerable tortures of an aching conscience, which is a foretaste of hell. 
I remember when I used to awake in the morning, the first thing I took up was Joseph Alain's Alarm to the Unconverted, or Richard Baxter's Call to the Unconverted. Oh, those books, those books. I read and devoured them when under a sense of guilt, but it was like sitting at the foot of Sinai. For five years as a child, there was nothing before my eyes but my guilt. And though I do not hesitate to say that those who observed my life would not have seen any extraordinary sin, yet as I looked upon myself, there was not a day in which I did not commit such gross, such outrageous sins against God that often and often have I wished I had never been born. Sickness is a terrible thing, more especially when it is accompanied with pain, when the poor body is racked to an extreme so that the spirit fails within us and we are dried up like a pot's herd. But I bear witness that sickness, however agonizing, is nothing like the discovery of the evil of sin. I'd rather pass through seven years of the most wearisome pain and the most languishing sickness than I would ever again pass through the terrible discovery of the evil of sin. It was my sad lot at that time to feel the greatness of my sin without a discovery of the greatness of God's mercy. I had to walk through this world with more than a world upon my shoulders and sustain a grief that as far exceeds all other griefs as a mountain exceeds a molehill. And I often wonder to this day how it was that my hand was kept from rending my own body in pieces through the awful agony which I felt when I discovered the greatness of my transgression. Yet I had not been openly and publicly a greater sinner than others, but heart sins were laid bare, sins of lip and tongue were discovered, and then I knew, oh, that I might never have to learn over again in such a dreadful school this terrible lesson. The iniquity of Judah and of Israel is exceeding great. Before I thought upon my soul salvation, I dreamed that my sins were very few. All my sins were dead and, as I imagine, buried in the graveyard of forgetfulness. But that trumpet of conviction, which aroused my soul to think of eternal things, sounded a resurrection note to all my sins, and oh, how they rose up in multitudes more countless than the sands of the sea. Now I saw that my very thoughts were enough to damn me, that my words would sink me lower than the lowest hell. And as for my acts of sin that now began to be a stench in my nostrils so that I could not bear them, I thought I had rather have been a frog or a toad than have been made a man. I reckoned that the most defiled creature, the most loathsome and contemptible, was a better thing than myself, for I had so grossly and grievously sinned against Almighty God. Through the Lord's restraining grace and the holy influence of my early home life, both at my father's and my grandfather's, I was kept from certain outward forms of sin in which others indulged, and sometimes when I began to take stock of myself, I really thought I was quite a respectable lad and might have been half inclined to boast that I was not like other boys, untruthful, dishonest, disobedient, swearing, Sabbath-breaking, and so on. But all of a sudden I met Moses carrying in his hand the law of God. And as he looked at me, he seemed to search me through and through with the eyes of fire. He bade me read God's ten words, the Ten Commandments. And as I read them, they all seemed to join in accusing and condemning me in the sight of the thrice holy Jehovah. Then, like Daniel, my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. And I understood what Paul meant when he wrote, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. When I saw myself in this condition, I could say nothing in self-defense or by way of excuse or extenuation. I confessed my transgression in solemn silence unto the Lord, but I could speak no word of self-justification or apology, for I felt that I was verily guilty of grievous sins against the Holy One of Israel. At that time a dreadful silence reigned within my spirit, even if I had tried to say a word in my own favor. I should have been self-condemned as a liar. I felt that Job's words might be applied to me. If I wash myself with snow water, and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him." Then there came into my startled conscience a remembrance of the universality of law. 
I thought of what was said of that old Roman Empire, that under the rule of Caesar, if a man once broke the law of Rome, the whole world was one vast prison to him, for he could not get out of the reach of the imperial power. So did it come to be in my aroused conscience. Wherever I went, the law had a demand upon my thoughts, upon my words, upon my rising, upon my resting. What I did and what I did not do all came under the cognizance of the law. And then I found that this law so surrounded me that I was always running against it. I was always breaking it. I seemed as if I was a sinner and nothing else but a sinner. If I opened my mouth, I spoke amiss. If I sat still, there was sin in my silence. I remember that when the Spirit of God was thus dealing with me, I used to feel myself to be a sinner even when I was in the house of God. I thought that when I sang, I was mocking the Lord with a solemn sound upon a false tongue. And if I prayed, I feared that I was sinning in my prayers, insulting him by uttering confessions, which I did not feel, and asking for mercies with a faith that was not true at all, but only another form of unbelief. At the very mention of that word conviction, I seemed to hear my chains rattling anew. Was there ever a bond slave who had more bitterness of soul than I, five years a captive in the dungeons of the law, till my youth seemed as if it would turn into premature old age, and all the buoyancy of my spirit had vanished? O God of the spirits of all men, most of all ought I to hate sin, for surely most of all have I smarted beneath the lash of thy law. While I was in the custody of the law, I did not take any pleasure in evil. Alas, I did sin, but my sense of the law of God kept me back from many forms of iniquity. I have thanked God a thousand times in my life that, before my conversion, when I had ill desires, I had no opportunities of sinning. And on the other hand, when I had the opportunities, I had no desires towards evil. When desires and opportunities come together like the flint and the steel, they make the spark that kindles the fire. But neither the one nor the other, though they may both be dangerous, can bring about any very great amount of evil so long as they are kept apart. I could not, as others did, plunge into profligacy or indulge in any of the grosser vices, for that law had me well in hand. I sinned enough without acting like that. Oh, I used to tremble to put one foot before another, for fear I should do wrong. I felt that my old sins seemed to be so many that it were well to die rather than commit any more. I could not rest while in the grip of the law. If I wanted to sleep a while, or to be a little indifferent and careless, some one or other of those Ten Commandments roughly aroused me, and looking on me with a frowning face said, You have broken me. I thought that I would do some good works, but somehow the law always broke my good works in the making. I fancied that if my tears flowed freely, I might make some recompense for my wrongdoing, but the law held up the looking glass, and I soon saw my face all smeared and made more unhandsome by my tears. The law seemed also to blight all my hopes with its stern sentence. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Only too well did I know that I had not continued in all those things, so I saw myself accursed, turn which way I might. If I had not committed one sin, that made no difference if I had committed another. I was under the curse. What if I had never blasphemed God with my tongue? Yet if I had coveted, I had broken the law. He who breaks a chain might say, I did not break that link. And the other link? No, but if you break one link, you have broken the chain. Ah, me, how I seemed shut up then. I had offended against the justice of God. I was impure and polluted. And I used to say, if God does not send me to hell, he ought to do it. I sat in judgment upon myself and pronounced a sentence that I felt would be just. I could not have gone to heaven with my sin unpardoned, even if I had had the offer to do it, for I knew that it would not be right that I should do so. And I justified God in my own conscience while I condemned myself. The law would not even let me despair. If I thought I would give up all desire to do right and just go and drown my conscience in sin, the law said, no, you cannot do that. There is no rest for you in sinning. You know the law too well to be able to sin in the blindness of a seared conscience. So the law worried and troubled me at all points. It shut me up as in an iron cage, and every way of escape was effectually blocked up. 
One of the things that shut me up dreadfully was when I knew the spirituality of the law. If the law said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, I said to myself, Well, I've never committed adultery. Then the law, as interpreted by Christ, said, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The law said, Thou shalt not steal. And I said, Well, I never stole anything. But then I found that even the desire to possess what was not my own was guilt. The spirituality of the law astounded me. What hope could I have of eluding such a law as this, which every way surrounded me with an atmosphere from which I could not possibly escape? Then I remembered that even if I had kept the law perfectly, and kept it for ten, twenty, or thirty years without a fault, yet if at the end of that time I should break it, I must suffer its dread penalty. Those words spoken by the Lord to the prophet Ezekiel came to my mind. If he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he has committed, he shall die for it. So I saw that I was indeed kept under the law, shut up. I had hoped to escape this way or that way or some other way. Was I not Christian when I was a child? Had I not been taken to a place of worship? Had I not been brought up to say my prayers regularly? Had I not been an honest, upright, moral youth? Was all this nothing? Nothing, said the law, as it drew its sword of fire. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So there was no rest for my spirit, nay, not even for a moment. What was I to do? I was in the hands of one who showed no mercy whatever. For Moses never said mercy. The law has nothing to do with mercy. That comes from another mouth and under another dispensation. But before faith came, I was kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. I am bold to say that, if man be destitute of the grace of God, his works are only works of slavery. He feels forced to do them. I know before I came into the liberty of the children of God, if I went to God's house, I went because I thought I must do it. If I prayed, it was because I feared some misfortune would happen in a day if I did not. If ever I thank God for a mercy, it was because I thought I should not get another if I were not thankful. If I performed a righteous deed, it was with the hope that very likely God would reward me at last and I should be winning a crown in heaven. I was a poor slave, a mere Gibeonite, hewing wood and drawing water. If I could have left off doing it, I should have loved to do so. If I could have had my will, there would have been no chapel going for me, no religion for me. I would have lived in the world and followed the ways of Satan, if I could have done as I pleased. As for righteousness, it was slavery. Sin would have been my liberty. Yet, truth to tell, of all bondage and slavery in this world, there is none more horrible than the bondage of sin. Tell me of Israel and Egypt, unsupplied with straw, yet preparing the full tale of bricks. Tell me of the Negro beneath the lash of his cruel taskmaster, and I confess it is a bondage fearful to be born. But there is one far worse, a bondage of a convinced sinner when he is brought to feel the burden of his guilt. The bondage of a man when once his sins are laying him low, like hounds about a weary stag. The bondage of a man when the burden of sin is on his shoulder, a burden too heavy for his soul to bear, a burden which will sink him in the depths of everlasting torment, unless he does escape from it. Methinks I see such a person, he has never a smile upon his face, dark clouds have gathered on his brow, solemn and serious he stands, his very words are sighs, his songs are groans, his smiles are tears, and when he seems most happy, hot drops of grief roll in burning showers, scalding furrows on his cheek. Ask him what he is, and he tells you he is a wretch undone. Ask him how he is, and he confesses that he is misery incarnate. Ask him what he shall be, and he says, I shall be lost in hell forever. There is no hope for me. Such is a poor, convinced sinner under bondage. Such have I been in my days, and I declare that, of all bondage, this is the most painful. The bondage of the law, the bondage of corruption. My impression is that this is the history of all the people of God, more or less. 
We are not all alike in every respect. We differ greatly in certain particulars, yet the main features of all the children of God will be found to be the same, and their Christian experience will resemble that of the other members of the Lord's family. I do not say that all have felt the apprehension of coming judgment as I did, but this is how it came to me. I knew that I was guilty. I knew that I had offended God. I knew that I had transgressed against light and knowledge, and I did not know when God might call me to account. But I did know this when I awoke in the morning. The first thought I had was that I had to deal with a justly angry God who might suddenly require my soul of me. Often during the day when I had a little time for quiet meditation, a great depression of spirit would come upon me because I felt that sin, sin, Sin had outlawed me from my God. I wondered that the earth bore up such a sinner as I was, and that the heavens did not fall and crush me, and the stars in their courses did not fight against such a wretch as I felt myself to be. Then indeed did I seem as if I should go down to the pit, and I had perpetually to endure the tortures of the never-dying worm of conscience that was gnawing at my heart. I went to the house of God and heard what I supposed was the gospel, but it was no gospel to me. My soul abhorred all manner of meat. I could not lay hold upon a promise or indulge a well-grounded hope of salvation. If anyone had asked me what would become of me, I must have answered, I'm going down to the pit. If anyone had entreated me to hope that mercy might come to me, I should have refused to entertain such a hope. I used to feel that I was in the condemned cell. In that dungeon the man writes bitter things against himself. He feels absolutely sure that the wrath of God abideth on him. He wonders the stones beneath his feet do not open a grave to swallow him up. He is astonished that the walls of the prison do not compress and crush him into nothingness. He marvels that he has breath, or that the blood in his veins does not turn into rivers of flame. His spirit is in a dreadful state. He not only feels that he shall be lost, but he thinks it is going to happen now. The condemned cell in Newgate, I am told, is just in such a corner that the criminal can hear the putting up of the scaffold. Well do I remember hearing my scaffold built, and the sound of the hammer of the law as piece after piece was put together. It appeared as if I heard the noise of the crowd of men and devils who had witnessed my eternal execution, all of them howling and yelling out their accursed things against my spirit. Then there was a big bell that tolled out the hours, and I thought that very soon the last moment would arrive and I must mount the fatal scaffold to be cast away forever. Oh, that condemned cell! Next to Tophet there can be no state more wretched than that of a man who is brought there. When I was for many a month in this state, I used to read the Bible through, and the threatenings were all printed in capitals. But the promises were in such small type I could not for long time make them out. And when I did read them, I did not believe they were mine, but the threatenings were all my own. There I said, when it says, He that believeth not shall be damned, that means me. But when it is said, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, then I thought I was shut out. When I read, He found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears, I thought, Ah, that is myself again. And when I read, That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned, Ah, I said, that describes me to the very letter. And when I heard the master say, Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? Ah, thought I, that is my text. He will have me down before long, and not let me cumber the ground any more. But when I read, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, I said, That does not belong to me, I am sure. And when I read, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, I said, That belongs to my brother, to my sister, or those I knew round about me, for they were all heavy laden. I thought, But I was not. And though God knoweth I would weep and cry and lament till my heart was breaking within me, if any man had asked me whether I sorrowed for sin, I should have told him, No, I never had any true sorrow for sin. Well, do you not feel the burden of sin? No. But you really are a convinced sinner. No, I should have said, I am not. 
Is it not strange that poor sinners, when they are coming to Christ, are so much in the dark that they cannot see their own hands? They are so blind that they cannot see themselves? And though the Holy Spirit has been pleased to work in them and give them godly fear and a tender conscience, they will stand up and declare that they have not those blessings, and that in them there is not any good thing, and that God has not looked on them nor loved them? I speak what I do know and not what I have learned by report when I say that there is a chamber in the experience of some men where the temptations of the devil exceed all belief. Read John Bunyan's Grace Abounding if you would understand what I mean. The devil tempted him. He says to doubt the existence of God and the truth of Scripture, the manhood of Christ, then his deity. And once he says he tempted him to say things which he will never write, lest he should pollute others. Ah, I recollect a dark hour with myself when I, who do not remember to have even heard a blasphemy in my youth, much less to have uttered one, found rushing through my mind an almost infinite number of curses and blasphemies against the Most High God. I especially recall a certain narrow and crooked lane in a country town along which I was walking one day while I was seeking the Savior. On a sudden it seemed as if the floodgates of hell had been opened. My head became a very pandemonium. Ten thousand evil spirits seemed to be holding carnival within my brain, and I held my mouth lest I should get utterance to the words of blasphemy that were poured into my ears. Things I had never heard of or thought of before came rushing impetuously into my mind, and I could scarcely withstand their influence. It was the devil throwing me down and tearing me. These things sorely beset me for half an hour together. The most fearful imprecations would dash through my brain. Oh, how I groaned and cried before God! That temptation passed away, but ere many days it was renewed again. And when I was in prayer, or when I was reading the Bible, these blasphemous thoughts would pour in upon me more than at any other time. I consulted with an aged godly man about it. He said to me, Oh, all this many of the people of God have proved before you. But, he asked, Do you hate these thoughts? I do, I truly answered. Then he said, They are not yours. Serve them as the old parish officers do with vagrants. Whip them and send them to their own parish. So, he said, do with those evil thoughts, groan over them, repent of them, and send them on to the devil, the father of them, to whom they belong, for they are not yours. I have never been thoroughly an unbeliever but once, and that was not before I knew the need of a Savior, but after it. It was just when I wanted Christ and panted after him, that on a sudden the thought crossed my mind, which I abhorred but could not conquer, that there was no God, no Christ, no heaven, no hell that all my prayers were but a farce, that I might as well have whistled to the winds or spoken to the howling waves. Ah, I remember how my ship drifted along through that sea of fire, loosened from the anchor of my faith, which I had received from my fathers. I no longer moored myself hard by the coasts of revelation. I said to reason, Be thou my captain. I said to my own brain, Be thou my rudder. And I started on my mad voyage. Thank God it is all over now, but I will tell you its brief history. It was once hurried, sailing over the tempestuous ocean of free thought. I went on, and as I went the skies began to darken, but to make up for that deficiency, the waters were gleaming with coruscations of brilliancy. I saw sparks flying upwards that pleased me, and I felt if this be free thought it is a happy thing. My thoughts seem gems, and I scatter stars with both my hands. But anon, instead of these coruscations of glory, I saw them grin, fins, fierce and horrible, start up from the waters. And as I dashed on, they gnashed their teeth and grinned upon me. They seized the prow of my ship and dragged me on, while I in part gloried the rapidity of my motion, but yet shuddered at the terrific rate with which I passed the old landmarks of my faith. I went to the very verge of the dreary realms of unbelief. I went to the very bottom of the sea of infidelity. I do think it often proves a great blessing to a man that he had a terrible conflict, a desperate encounter, a hard-fought engagement in passing from the empire of Satan into the kingdom of God's dear Son. 
Sooner or later, each saved man will have his hand-to-hand -hand fight with the Prince of Darkness, and as a general rule, it is a great mercy to have it over at the outset of one's career, and to be able afterwards to feel whatever comes upon me, I never can suffer as I suffered when I was seeking Christ. Whatever staggering doubt or hideous blasphemy or ghastly insinuations, even of suicide itself, may assail my feeble heart, they cannot outdo the horror of great darkness through which my spirit passed when I was struggling after a Savior. I do not say that it is desirable that we should have this painful ordeal, much less that we should seek it as an evidence of regeneration. But when we have passed through it victoriously, we may so use it that it may be a perpetual armory to us, if we can now defy all doubts and fears that come, because they cannot be so potent as those which already in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior we have overthrown. Shall we not use that fact for ourselves, and cannot we equally well use it for others? Fully often have I found it good when I have talked with a young convert in deep distress about his sin, to tell him something more of his anxious plight than he knew how to express. And he has wondered where I found it, though he would not have wondered if he had known where I had been, and how much deeper in the mire than he. When he has talked about some horrible thought that he has had with regard to the impossibility of his own salvation, I have said, Why have I thought that a thousand times, and yet have overcome it through the help of God's Spirit? I know that a man's own self-experience is one of the very best weapons he can use in fighting with evil in other men's hearts. Often their misery and despondency, aggravated, as it commonly is by a feeling of solitariness, will be greatly relieved before it is effectually driven out when they find that a brother has suffered the same, and yet has been able to overcome. Do I show him how precious the Savior is to my soul? He glorifies God in me. Right soon will he look into the same dear face and be lightened, and then he will magnify the Lord with me, and we shall exalt his name together. Multitudes of persons are selling in what they think to be the good ship of self-righteousness. They are expecting that they shall get to heaven in her. But she never did carry a soul safely into the fair haven yet, and she never will. Self-righteousness is as rapid a road to ruin as outward sin in itself. We may as certainly destroy ourselves by opposing the righteousness of Christ as by transgressing the law of God. Self-righteousness is as much an insult to God as blasphemy is, and God will never accept it, neither shall any soul enter heaven by it. Yet this vessel manages to keep on her way against all the opposition of Scripture, for often men have a soft south wind blowing, and things go easily with them, and they believe that through their own doings they shall assuredly find the port of peace. I am glad, therefore, when some terrible tempest overtakes this vessel, and when men's hopes through their own doings and their own feelings are utterly wrecked. Before I came to Christ, I said to myself, It surely cannot be that if I believe in Jesus just as I am, I shall be saved. I must feel something. I must do something. I could pour scorn upon myself to think of some of the good resolutions I made. I blew them up like children with their pipes and their soap, and fine bubbles they were, reflecting all the colors of the rainbow. But a touch and they dissolved. They were good for nothing, poor stuff to build eternal hopes upon. Oh, that working for salvation, what slavery it was, but what small results it produced. Oh, the many times that I wished a preacher would tell me something to do that I might be saved. Gladly would I have done it if it had been possible. If he had said, take off your shoes and stockings and run to John O'Groats, I would not even have gone home first, but would have started off that very night that I might win salvation. How often have I thought that if I had said, bear your backs to the scourge and take fifty lashes, I would have said, here I am, come along with your whip and beat as hard as you please so long as I can obtain peace and rest and get rid of my sin. Yet that simplest of all matters, believing in Christ crucified, accepting his finished salvation, being nothing and letting him be everything, doing nothing but trusting to what he has done, I could not get a hold of it. Once I thought there was salvation in good works, and I labored hard and strove diligently to preserve a character for integrity and uprightness. But when the Spirit of God came into my heart, sin revived, and I died. That which I thought had been good proved to be evil, wherein I fancied I had been holy. I found myself to be unholy. I discovered that my very best actions were sinful. 
that my tears needed to be wept over, and that my prayers needed God's forgiveness. I discovered that I was seeking after salvation by the works of the law, that I was doing all my good works from a selfish motive, namely to save myself, and therefore they could not be acceptable to God. I found out that I could not be saved by good works for two very good reasons. First, I had not got any, and secondly, if I had any, they could not save me. After that, I thought surely salvation might be obtained partly by reformation and partly by trusting in Christ. So I labored hard again and thought if I added a few prayers here and there, a few tears of penitence and a few vows of improvement, all would be well. But after fagging on for many a weary day like a poor blind horse toiling round the mill, I found I had gone no further, for there was still the curse of God hanging over me, and there was still an aching void in my heart which the world could never feel, a void of distress and care, for I was sorely troubled because I could not attain unto the rest which my soul desired. What a struggle that was which my young heart waged against sin. When God the Holy Ghost first quickened me, little did I know of the precious blood which has put my sins away and drowned them in the depths forever. But I did know this, that I could not remain as I was, that I could not rest happy unless I became something better, something purer than I was, and oh, how my spirit cried to God with groanings, I say it without any exaggeration, groanings that could not be uttered, and oh, how I sought in my poor dark way to overcome first one sin and then another, and so to do battle, in God's strength against the enemies that assailed me, and not, thank God, altogether without success, though still the battle had been lost unless he had come who was the overcomer of sin and the deliverer of his people, and put the hosts to flight. I trod a long time to improve myself, but I never did make much of it. I found I had a devil within me when I began, and I had ten devils when I left off. Instead of becoming better, I became worse. I had now got the devil of self-righteousness, of self-trust and self-conceit, and many others that had come and taken up their lodging within my heart. While I was busy sweeping my house and garnishing it, beheld the one I sought to get rid of, and had only gone for a little season, returned and brought with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they entered and dwelt there. Then I labored to believe. It is a strange way of putting it, yet so it was. When I wished to believe, I found I could not. It seemed to me that the way to heaven by Christ's righteousness was as difficult as by my own, and that I could as soon get to heaven by Sinai as by Calvary. I could do nothing. I could neither repent nor believe. I fainted with despair, feeling as if I must be lost despite the gospel, and be forever driven from Jehovah's presence, even though Christ had died. I must confess that I never would have been saved if I could have helped it. As long as ever I could, I rebelled and revolted and struggled against God. When he would have me pray, I would not pray. When he would have me listen to the sound of the ministry, I would not. And when I heard and a tear rolled down my cheek, I wiped it away and defied him to melt my heart. There came an election sermon, but that did not please me. There came a lost sermon showing me my powerlessness, but I did not believe it. I thought it was a whim of some old experimental Christian, some dogma of ancient times that would now suit men. Then there came another sermon concerning death and sin, but I did not believe I was dead, for I thought I was alive enough and could repent and make myself right by and by. Then there came a strong exhortation sermon, but I felt I could set my house in order when I liked, as well as I could do it at once. And so did I continually trust in my own self-sufficiency. When my heart was a little touched, I tried to divert it with sinful pleasures, and would not then have been saved until God gave me the effectual blow and I was obliged to submit to that irresistible effort of his grace. It conquered my depraved will and made me bow myself before his gracious scepter. When the Lord really brought me to myself, he sent one great shot which shivered me to pieces, and lo, I found myself utterly defenseless. I thought I was more mighty than the angels and could accomplish all things, but I found myself less than nothing. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down. Cannot I remember when he also told me to come down? One of the first steps I had to take was to go right down from my own good works, and oh, what a fall was that. Then I stood upon my own self-sufficiency, and Christ said, Come down. 
I have pulled you down from your own good works, and now I will pull you down from your self-sufficiency. So I had another fall, and I felt sure I had gained the bottom, but again Christ said, Come down. And he made me come down till I fell on some point at which I felt I was yet savable. But still the command was, Down, sir, come down further yet. And down I came until in despair I had to let go of every bough of the tree of my hopes. And then I said, I can do nothing, I am ruined. The waters were wrapped around my head, and I was shut out from the light of day, and thought myself a stranger from the commonwealth of Israel. But Christ said, Come down lower yet, sir. Thou was too much pride to be saved. Then I was brought down to see my corruption, my wickedness, my filthiness. For God always humbles a sinner whom he means to save. While I was in this state trying to make myself believe, a voice whispered, Vain man, vain man, if thou wouldst believe, come and see. Then the Holy Spirit led me by the hand to a solitary place, and while I stood there, suddenly there appeared before me one upon his cross. I looked up, I, I had then no faith. I saw his eyes suffused with tears and the blood still flowing. I saw his enemies about him, hunting him to his grave. I marked his miseries unutterable. I heard the groaning which cannot be described, and as I looked up, he opened his eyes and said to me, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair until now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning while I was going to a certain place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a side street and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel there may have been a dozen or fifteen people. I had heard of the primitive Methodists, how they sang so loudly that they made people's heads ache. But that did not matter to me. I wanted to know how I might be saved. And if they could tell me that, I did not care how much they made my head ache. The minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. At last a very thin-looking man, a shoemaker, or tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. Now it is well that preachers should be instructed, but this man was really stupid. He was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. The text was, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in that text. The preacher began thus, My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, Look. Now look and don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool and yet you can look. A man needn't be worth a thousand a year to be able to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. I, said he in broad Essex, many on ye are looking to yourselves, but it's no use looking there. You'll never find any comfort in yourselves. Some look to God the Father, no look to him by and by. Jesus Christ says, look unto me. Some on ye say, we must wait for the Spirit's work. You have no business with that just now. Look to Christ. The text says, look unto me. Then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me, I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I am hanging on the cross. Look unto me, I am dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me, look unto me. When he had gone to about that length and managed to spin out ten minutes or so, he was at the end of his tether. Then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say with so few present, he knew me to be a stranger. Just fixing his eyes on me as if he knew all my heart, he said, Young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did, but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearance before. However, it was a good blow struck right home. He continued, And you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death, if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now this moment, you will be saved. Then lifting up his hands, he shouted, as only a primitive Methodist could do, Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look! 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 You have nothing to do but to look and live. I saw at once the way of salvation. I know not what else he said. I did not take much notice of it. I was so possessed with that one thought. 
Like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up, the people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. I'd been waiting to do 50 things, but when I heard that word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could almost have looked my eyes away. There and then the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away. In that moment I saw the sun. And I could have risen that instant and sung with the most enthusiastic of them, of the precious blood of Christ and the simple faith which looks alone to him. Oh, that somebody had told me this before. Trust Christ and you shall be saved. Yet it was no doubt all wisely ordered. And now I can say, Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply, Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. I do from my soul confess that I never was satisfied till I came to Christ when I was yet a child. I had far more wretchedness than ever I have now. I will even add more weariness, more care, more heartache than I know at this day. I may be singular in this confession, but I make it and know it to be the truth. Since that dear hour when my soul cast itself on Jesus, I have found solid joy and peace. But before that, all those supposed gaieties of early youth, all the imagined ease and joy of boyhood, were but vanity and vexation to me. That happy day when I found the Savior and learned to cling to his dear feet was a day never to be forgotten by me. An obscure child, unknown, unheard of, I listened to the word of God, and that precious text led me to the cross of Christ. I can testify that the joy of that day was utterly indescribable. I could have leaped, I could have danced, there was no expression, however fanatical, which would have been out of keeping with the joy of my spirit at that hour. The Conversion of Charles Spurgeon from his own autobiography. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.